Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming, um, fighting the heat and the traffic to join us this evening. So we're going to cover um, several um, important topics tonight. Um, we're going to start off talking about our 2022 bond program and the recommended um, projects. And then we'll follow that up with um, our transportation and public works projects that are happening in your district. Then we'll go into redistricting, and then we have um, our police department here to answer any questions that you all might have um, about anything that's happening in your neighborhoods. So um, first, I'm going to ask Councilmember Moon to come up and welcome everybody. All right, welcome to uh, District 4. This is actually District 7, but you know we're not telling anybody. So just a little history here um, and a little uh, update on, on how we'll proceed today. I'll kind of speak a little bit towards each topic before the presenter gets there. Um, Carrie Moon been elected since 2015, I represent District 4, and District 4 pretty much is south of Golden Triangle, all the way down to I-30, this side of I-35, all right, 114,000 people, just under 115,000. We'll come back and revisit that topic uh, when we get to talk about our redistricting process that will happen over the next few months. As far as bond dollars, what I want you to remember for City of Fort Worth, it's a pretty easy formula. Every two years, you elect your elected officials, and that's in your odd number of years. So I was just elected in 2021, first time I was elected 2015, every two years thereafter, all right? As a city, we try to do just elected officials uh, in odd number of years, Every four years, in even numbers, we have a bond election. We'll have one in May of 2022. We had one in 2018, had in 2014. All right. Um, our goal is to make sure we all vote, make sure we get our neighbors to vote. We've seen record turnout in each of our last two elections, not just citywide, but also from this, uh, from our area up here. Um, and then also, every four years, we'll do some type of charter election or uh, some other type of election in addition to the bond bond that's on the on the uh, on the referendum. So always keep that in mind. So May of 2022, we'll have Roger speak to some of the programs that are going to be on that bond um, uh, coming up in May. So Roger, floor is yours. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, my name is Roger Venables. I'm with the Aviation Department. It sounds kind of odd. I'm up here talking about bonds and facilities and roads citywide, but formerly I was with the property management department and where we would build and construct from cradle to grave the facilities that's managed by the city. I have to be involved in the process and I agreed I would stay on. I like bond programs, so um, that's why I'm up here talking to you about it today. So really, <laughs> I want to start off talking a little bit about you know, your program goals and objectives. You know, for any bond program, we need to really set some goals that serve as a litmus test for us later on when we've put the program together and said, did we accomplish the goals that we set out for? So, one, maintain and improve existing infrastructure and address equity. Two, provide mobility and city services, particularly in those growth areas. Uh, enhance active transportation and recreational corridors. Uh, allow for some flexibility and partnership opportunities. And with this bond program, there are some partnership opportunities presented himself with Tarrant County that I'll talk about. And then achieve balance in fiscal stewardship. So if you think about it in terms of if we build a new facility, we're going to have to staff it. We've got to keep the lights on. Again, there's going to be operating expenses that need to be accounted for in future years when that, when that facility goes online. So a little bit about the strategy. Uh, obviously, capital delivery and accelerating that delivery is, is paramount. You know, we, especially, particularly in a fast-growing community like City of Fort Worth, um, we're always challenged a little bit, sometimes by right-of-way acquisition or uh, relocation of franchised utilities um, before we can even start our portion of the project. $29 million has been set aside separate from the bond program that we're starting to go into plan design to get to 60%. 60%, you should have your right-of-way already identified. In most cases, we want to be able to have the actual parcel descriptions where we can go out and approach those property owners in advance of 2022 and start talking about either a dedication of right-of-way or, in some instances, if we have funding, acquire some right-of-way. 
And then, of course, resources, reserve debt capacity. We're not using all the debt capacity that the city has available to it to, uh, for projects. We want to reserve some of that. There may be emergency situations that come up outside of the bond program. There may be grant opportunities or match opportunities or transit-oriented development, for instance, that we may want to be able to participate in. Again, this, this reserving this debt capacity gives us that flexibility. And so when we looked at the program and just some things that stood off the page, when we looked at the program highlights, about $213 million is being leveraged for partnership opportunities um, for, from Tarrant County and outside funding sources, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. About $229 million in transportation infrastructure, community center facilities, and parks and recreation, and then about $100 million for park improvement and open space conservation. We have a new category this year for the bond program, and that's open space conservation. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Usually you have about three primary categories, for facilities, streets and transportation, and parks. There's a fourth one added, and it's conservation. So on tax rate allocations, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the city manager presented a budget that called for a one and a half cent decrease in the tax rate. Again, no tax rate increase associated with this bond program. This would be the overall tax rate as it applies to the ad valorem tax collected by the city. So 73.25 cents per $100 of assessed value. And how that's broken out is important. 58 and a half cents of that goes to operation and maintenance. So if you think about the ongoing thing about paying salaries, maintaining facilities, et cetera, 14 and three quarter cents is going to debt. That helps pay down our debt. That goes directly to debt service, whether it's through tax notes, general obligation bonds, or if we have a debt, this would help support the retirement of that debt. In the operations and maintenance side, there's been a deliberate effort over the last few years at about six and a half cents per $100 that goes to capital maintenance. The one thing we don't want to do is defer that maintenance and shorten the life cycle of that asset only to have to come back in general obligation bonds and try to replace those facilities or those roads in advance of when their, should, their life cycle should be. So it goes right in, TPW is allocated funds every year to take care of roads. Uh, facilities is allocated funding every year to take care of general maintenance on our facilities. Again, working through the entire life cycle of the asset. So as far in terms of development of the project, you know, sometimes we get asked how do these things come to fruition and, and how are they born or conceived through a number of different ways. You know, we're, collective, we're collecting data daily, you know, whether it's TPW or facilities looking at the condition index of a facility, whether it's TPW looking at the pavement condition index. Again, quantitative measures we use. Then you have master plan and strategic goals that form that guidance document, if you will, for future capital investment in the future. And then development activity. We see development activity, and obviously we're trying to meet the needs of where that growth is occurring. City Council will also have projects that will be brought forward. There are waitlisted projects, some 2018 bond. They may be from previous bonds. It didn't quite make the cut, but this year they're still needed projects, but they can be included in the 2022 public meetings, meet service demands, boards and commissions. Again, various places that provide input into projects over time. So the selection process. We go out to the departments, and it started, this process started about a year and a half ago. We go out to the departments and we ask for their projects. They need to rank and prioritize their projects and submit them to a committee. It's a prioritization committee that's really formed by individuals from the various departments within the city that take the first pass, if you will, first filtering process of those projects. Again, we want the departments to submit to us what they believe their greatest needs are. Prioritization committee's task is to look through those through a broad lens of criteria, and I'll talk about those in just a moment. But we went through that process, and it goes to management for review. So we go take it up to the city manager's office and say, here are some of the recommendations that are coming out of the committee. Another filtering process. They'll ask deeper questions. We may have opportunities to fund some of these projects using other sources of funding rather than bonds. The bonds we really want to use for those big ticket items, right, for new facilities or huge capital replacements. So again, we want to try to handle the maintenance side of those with the maintenance that's been reserved out of the operating and maintenance. 
Then we take it to City Council for review, and we've done that. And City Council has provided some input to us, but more importantly, they want to push it. They want to take it out to the community and say, let's get your input about what's being recommended or proposed for this program. So the citywide prioritization criteria, you recognize that each department may have its own criteria they use to rank and prioritize their projects. Some of those criteria, like these, are included in that selection process, but again, they might be germane or very strategic for that department, okay? But this is the one that you look at across all project types. Equity is a new criterion that we included in the 2022 bond program. It was not included in the 2018, and I'll explain to how that equity criteria works in just a moment. Again, we're trying to, does the project address service deficiencies? We know there's deficiencies in services around the city. We're looking at leverage opportunities. Do we have an opportunity, like Tarrant County, to maybe pull in some funding to help build some of the, the larger ticket items, if you will, or projects that are out there? Uh, is it a part of the approved master plan? Is it a capital replacement? Is it collaborating with another department? We've got some facilities that will be multi-purpose. I'll talk about a stop six community hub in just a moment, but it will have a library included in it. It will have social services delivery that can be made out of that facility as well, and it'll have a recreation component. Again, it's a collaboration. Public health and safety, does it help address any environmental or safety concern? Is there a mandate? Sometimes we get through contractual obligations, we have to put these out for bond consideration. And then, of course, economic development. Will the project help st directly stimulate economic development? So equity as a criteria, what you're seeing on the map here really represents the majority minority areas and the super majority minority areas. Those are with populations of 75% or more minority. So we wanted to include this as a criteria to ensure there weren't any disparities that were being created in the selection process. We've got a lot of aging infrastructure in some of these places that definitely needed to be addressed. So this helped us get there. And so we took it right out of the Race and Culture Task Force and asked the question, is the project located within or serve a supermajority minority area, majority minority area? So where did we start? So this, this represents the aggregate dollar amount of those projects that were submitted to us by the departments, almost $1.3 billion. The good news is, in 2018, it was close to $1.8 billion. So some progress being made, but again, I don't think we'll, we'll ever, we don't have enough to address what the needs are. And then remember, we're only gonna have a finite amount that we can use for debt to, to, to accomplish these facilities. But as you can imagine, streets and, and transportation, as it generally is, will take up the lion's share of those projects being submitted. Facilities following up with parks at about 17% and of course open space conservation. Here's the current project distribution. I'll go over these projects in a little bit more detail. Uh, proposed bond package is $500 million at this point. Uh, again, the lion's share of about 64% going to streets and transportation. That's about $320 million. You've got Parks and Rec at about uh, $67 million. We've got, a couple, we've got a library, a new library improvement plan, fire safety improvements. We've got two facilities that are in desperate need of replacement. Um, and then, of course, we have a police facility, new police facility planned. Uh, and then two new community centers and, of course, open space conference. So on the streets of mobility, this map just is anything more than just to highlight the distribution of where these projects are around the town. This map to my, le to my left, your right, will have a little bit more detail about where those are. We're, I think I just sent today to uh, Michelle's group um, an interactive map, if you will, that you'll be able to log into, make comments about specific projects, make comments in general about the bond program. And that should be up and running, and I'd say in the next couple of days. So here they are when you lay back in the majority minority areas and super majority areas where those projects lie. So in the streets of mobility, there are the four that are highlighted in red or red font. Those are project types which we've made application and submitted to Tarrant County for consideration as part of their bond program scheduled for November of this year. 
We haven't got the final word back from if they're going to accept all those projects that we've submitted to them. But just so you know, that represents about 149 million in the arterial side, about 16.4, 16.4 million on the intersections. Traffic lights about four and a half million in a, a grade separated crossing at about 30 million dollars. We have some outside funding sources, either from impact fees or future improvement agreements that we've done with developers. That adds, all that adds up to about another $52 million. So the takeaway really from this is trying to take the $317 million that we're asking for in the bond program and leverage that to put $570 million worth of improvements on the ground. Recognizing we can't go at it alone is the reason why we've, we've sought out assistance and participations from Tarrant County. So on the proposed arterials, here are the proposed arterials. We looked at, I think, well, correct me on this, there's about 58 different arterials that were looked at. These are the highest ranking arterials submitted by the department. There are a couple of arterials on here that are germane to District 4, and that's Ray White Road North and South. Now, Ray Wright Road South, the good news is it may not have any real right-of-way acquisition attached to it, which is good, because then we're only dealing with the relocation of um, the public franchise utilities. The north section will have some right-of-way acquisition attached to it. We don't know how much and at this point, but that's why we're going through the exercise of plan design now that I mentioned earlier. Those two projects alone, I think, are somewhere around $22 million for those two. So we've got some established corridors that we want to help support transit initiatives. We've got $10 million that we're recommending to set aside for Lancaster Avenue that can go towards local match. Eastbury and McCart Avenue, again, those are $2.5 million on the design side, but we may be able to use some of that for right-of-way acquisition or have some flexibility, and we'll build that into the language. We would build that into the language of the bond. Here are the proposed intersection projects. Uh, you've got uh, North Tarrant Parkway at, uh, at Beach Street is the intersection in, in District 4. I'll just kind of rest on those for a minute so you can see where those intersections lie. So our Vision Zero High Injury Network is a Vision Zero is more of an initiative, if you will of looking at those transportation corridors that have the highest severe injury and fatality within the city. We've identified 10 of those. Uh, I'm gonna show you the list in just a moment. We're gonna be working with an outside consultant to determine what improvements can be made to those corridors that would help to reduce or eliminate, again, the Vision Zero uh, fatalities within those corridors. So here are those top 10 quarters, if you will. Okay, on the parks and recreation side, uh, we've got a listing of the project types on the left here, left-hand side of the map. Uh, kind of shows you the distribution of where these projects are. where they lie within the majority minority areas. 23 of the 33 park projects are really contained within those, we need a super majority minority or majority minority area. So again, we've got a little leverage opportunity on the park side as well. So we've got a plan for the uh, heritage and paddock park renovation and improvements. Uh, we've got eight, $8.3 million of outside funding source that being contributed to that project. We've got another million and a half that's kind of a carryover from the 2014 bond. Again, trying to, trying to get about $85 million worth of, uh, of our money leveraged to get about $100 million worth of improvements on the ground. To the right really represents the first year O&M. So as we're putting these projects together, and as I mentioned earlier, if it's something new, if we're building upon a facility, if we develop a park for the first time, now we have maintenance obligations. That first year O&M is our best guess on the year in which it's delivered, we're gonna to have to incur those additional operating and maintenance expenses. So we wanna plan for that in budget in future years. So on the parks and recreation, you know, uh, 
<clears throat> tenant garden infrastructure improvements. You know, on about a year, a little over a year ago, we entered into agreement with the Botanic Research Institute of Texas where they're going to take over the management and maintenance and operation of the uh, botanic gardens. When we turned it over to them, we turned them over facilities that were in dire need of either replacement or repair, significant deferred uh, maintenance over time. Our commitment under that agreement is we would put forward on future bond programs, catch-up dollars, if you will, to replace some of those aged facilities that they took over. Mind you, they'll have the obligation to maintain it going forward, but this at least it helps get them back and the city back to a point where we've got uh, better facilities on the ground. Heritage and Paddock Park renovation and site improvements. Not only they have the two parks, we've got uh, you know Heritage Park, which really is inaccessible for most part. It needs a lot of work. The the infrastructure is terrible out there. This is these dollars are going to go to rehabilitate Heritage Park, Paddock Park, but also some street improvements there where the convergence onto Main Street. So that can be a much more pedestrian friendly environment. Fort Worth Water Gardens. Water Gardens has been out there since the 70s. It's undergone some renovation over time, some repairs, but we've got some significant plumbing and infrastructure out there that needs to be repaired. A lot of those bald cypress that were planted out there have some nice deep roots that have made their way into that infrastructure, and so we need to come repair all that. And so this would be six and a half million dollars towards that. Drainage and erosion control. I mentioned too that you typically want to handle a lot of this stuff with maintenance. However, these were deferred over a period of time. We're starting to catch up on stuff that were deferred over periods of time. Plus you have dams out there that need significant, they may need replacement. It's not a matter of just maintaining them, it's a matter of replacing them. It's a matter of coming in and dredging out those ponds that really serve as, as stormwater uh, retention areas in the parks. So it's being able to deepen those out and again, improve the storage capacity. Meadowbrook Golf Course renovation. You know, Meadowbrook Golf Course, much like we did with, um, with Rockwood. First thing is go in and let's look at the tees, let's look at the fairways, let's look at the cart paths, let's take a look at the, um, uh, any of the drainage features out there that need to be repaired and addressed and redo it. Refresh the golf course, if you will, and, and improve playability. Sycamore Park improvements. You know, we did commission Sycamore Golf Course, I guess it's been now almost a couple of years, within the last couple of years. This is coming back in and creating a community, okay, community park. So what we want to do is come back in and master plan it as a community park with all the facilities that you would generally see associated with a community park. And that would be at about $5 million. Stop Six Enhanced Neighborhood Family Aquatics Facility. So this is about $7 million to do an outdoor aquatics facility. Where we're looking at locating this facility right now is adjacent to the Stop 6 Community Center hub, uh, which is across from Rosedale Park in the Stop 6 area. It would go, it would still be a public facility, but it would, it would rest adjacent to the Stop 6 hub itself. Forest Park pool replacement, been a long time coming. It needs to be replaced. We're suggesting replacing with an enhanced um, neighborhood family aquatics facility. There was $900,000 that was set aside right now for the Parks Department to begin that design process so that when a successful bond election and have those dollars available, we can get started faster on the facility. Echo Lake. We got this as about 41 acres that we received from the county in about 2017. Well, they, like we left the Brit, left us with a lot of facilities that needed to be replaced and rehabilitated. And so we want to come back in with that $5 million and do just that. You know, a lot of the facilities that we have out there are not safe, they're not ADA compliant. There's a, a myriad of issues associated with it. And it sits adjacent to Worth Heights Community Center, so it's a good interface with the community center. Gateway Park Development, this is another $8 million that we can put toward design and construction of some park, more park improvements, uh, athletic fields, skate park, uh, parking lot, security lighting, et cetera. These neighborhood park improvements, so these are parks that have been acquired over time, and they call them reserve parks, but basically they're just awaiting their time to be developed, okay? 
And so these neighborhood parks would be about eight of them located throughout the city, about five and a half million dollars. And again, it would go to master plan those neighborhood parks and put what you would see normally in our, our uh, neighborhood parks as playgrounds and shelters and um, you could have walking paths, et cetera, picnic facilities. So the Fort Worth Zoo, I mentioned earlier about a contractual obligation. Um, we have one with the Fort Worth, the manager of the Fort Worth Zoo. And so our obligation is to provide the utilities and infrastructure necessary to support future exhibits. So when they build a new exhibit, we need to provide the infrastructure for it. This three and a half million dollars will go towards that effort. Trail Gap Connections, this is about three and a, uh, five point five million dollars that we're gonna put towards, we already know where these trail these gaps and connections are. We would try to utilize as money, much of this fund, Texas Parks and Wildlife and others, to get other grants so we can extend and do even more of the gap connection between some of these. We've identified three locations that are of interest, Bomber, Bomber Spur Trail being one of them. Uh, and on that map, you, when you take a look at it, you can see the three that we've got kind of targeted at this point. Open space conservation, I mentioned earlier, and I'm not as good at articulating this as Jennifer is. She's very passionate about open space conservation. But really what we're trying to do is if we don't preserve some of this sensitive ecosystem that we have around the city, it will evaporate. It'll either get developed, it'll be taken in. You know, for livability of a neighborhood is having that open space is important. And so we want to be able to take this funding and preserve those highly sensitive areas. Facility improvements. So community centers. As I mentioned, we have a couple of community centers to be replaced, a new police facility, fire, a couple of fire station facility replacements, and of course, a public library. So on those facilities, again, fire station 16 replacement, 37, which I believe is up here in District 4, is replaced. And I'll talk a little bit about that particular facility. Uh, Far Northwest Library, we've got one planned again uh, up near Avondale Haslett, uh, across from Sundara Ranch. Uh, Stop Six Hub, which I've mentioned a couple of times, Fire Station Community Center. This is a, this is a waitlisted project from 2018. It and Diamond Hill were neck and neck in terms of which one would get replaced first. Diamond Hill just a little bit ahead of it. We've already, well, I think we're gonna have a groundbreaking here in the next uh, week or two. Um, and the Northwest Patrol Facility. Library system improvements, again, a little over $12 million for a new library, and where I mentioned at Sendera, Sendera Ranch around Avondale Haslett. We'll build about an 18,000 square foot library. You know, it, when we looked at the growth, this was before the census came out. Within that particular area, we gained about 3,900 people or residents in a pandemic year, moved into that area within a three mile radius. We're almost at 20,000 people within a three mile radius now. And further supported by the most recent census data, 76% growth rate just in the north section. Fire station 37 replacement. 37 was really, in, is intended to be a, a, a temporary fire station. It was moved on site in 1998. It's on a long Ray Wright Road. It's at 4721 Ray Wright Road. It is woefully undersized for our three-bay double company station. It's about half the size of what we build them today. And again, it's temporary. It sits on a blind curve, so it makes it a little bit of a challenge for the fire department to deploy out of the site and get back into the site. So again, we're gonna look at probably another location in close proximity to it. Again, we'll work with the fire department to determine where their best response efforts are with the new station. Fire station 16 was built in the 60s. Fire Station 16, again, is about half the size, and it's located on Gettys at Hewlin. Uh, it's about half the size of our three-bay double company station. Um, so many things wrong with this, with this particular fire station. It can accommodate female firefighters. It's got, the bay doors are too small for modern fire apparatus, so we actually have to lower the suspension of the fire trucks to get them in the station. Again, we think there's a better way to, to operate a fire station. It's aged and you can tell it, this would replace it at about $8.2 million. It may not be located on exactly the same site because it's kind of tucked into near a residential neighborhood with a very narrow uh, 
very narrow land mass for its construction, so we may look at putting it somewhere else. Community centers, the stop six hub community center, about $17.5 million would go to this project. This would be replacing the existing MLK community center. We have an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to collaborate a lot of functions in there. The library, social services, recreation. Again, this facility would house those. Uh, and then adjacent to it, as I mentioned, we would put the enhanced neighborhood aquatics facility. So it's quite a transformative project. Fire station community center replacement. Again, this was a waitlisted project. This is an old fire station built in the 20s. We've tried to build around it over time and added on to it, and it looks exactly like we tried to do. We've added on to it, and a lot of the facility is really inaccessible for our programming needs, particularly the second floor. So again, we're recommending not removal of all the historic nature of the fire center, the old fire station itself, but again, deliberately design it so it can be incorporated into the facility. Police facility improvements, we just closed on 60 acres at about the 3900 block of Angle Avenue. That's there to support a new 32,000 square foot facility for the Northwest Patrol. Right now, they're housed in other locations, one of which they pay about $151,000 a year in rent. We can liberate them from that payment of rent on an annual basis because right now it comes out of their operating expense. They'll have another 151000 and go over to operating, and we can cover the rest on the debt service side. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, so you'll take uh, some of the folks from the north side, some of the folks that are really on the uh, east side of Main Street. They're actually right adjacent to Meacham Airport. And some others from other locations and consolidated into one facility. That 60, we won't eat up all 66 acres, but it does provide us for flexibility for other facility improvements to support, uh, support the police in the future. So here's the schedule and where we're at today. You know, we're spending this time uh, going out and, and seeking your input um, through really the end of October. Uh, we'll spend the rest of the time right now. Again, reevaluating some of these facility projects that were costed out maybe six months ago. Uh, we've seen some spikes in products, some supply shortages, there's some uh, increases in concrete, and there's labor costs, and everything has changed a little bit. So, what we want to do is come back in and make sure that our assumptions on what those costs will be two years or three years from now when this project gets put on the ground if we feel comfortable with those. So we, gen we get with consultants to help us do that. Uh, depending on the facility, we'll select a consultant that we know has, has worked on those type of facilities of recent, and they'll be able to help us out. We also have to look at all the site design costs. So it's not just about the building, it's about the site that it sits on. And then of course, city council action, somewhere around January, February, uh, they would set the bond referendum. At that point in time, then we go back out with an, another meeting that would talk about here are the projects that are actually been selected for you to consider and vote on. And it will, we'll break about into propositions for you at that time too, so you know exactly what we're talking about. Um, and then of course the bond election schedule for May 7th, 2022. And just to highlight that this capital improvement is not a static event, it's ongoing. So on May 8th, we will start looking at 2026. We'll start looking that far ahead uh, for the next bond program or next bond cycle. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, what I'd like to suggest is we have some folks from TPW here today, uh, Lauren Pereira. Is Parks back there, are they represented? Gary, there's David Creek in the back. So if you have specific and want more detail, about a particular project, go, go meet with them because they're the experts in their projects and we're more, more, uh, more apt to uh, field the question better than me and give you better details. But I'll be happy to answer general question. Oh, I'm reminded by Michelle, one other thing. On the side over here, I've got this list and this is a complete summary of all the projects uh, that I just went over. Give you a little bit more detail, give you a little bit more about the cost of it. Again, uh, we're gonna have something out on the website that's gonna be a lot more detailed too, but I would definitely seek some of the experts tonight later on. I think we'll stay a little bit longer to 
to answer any of those questions. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Roger. Um, this is just part of the public process. This engagement with you all and, and your attendance here is is one of the steps prior to our May 2022 election. Now, it's a lot of information, but we want to engage in this public process so you have uh, can be part of that and be knowledgeable of what you're voting on. Know that in 2015, we did pass a resolution uh, mayor and council that staff cannot move money from one project to another project without the consent of city council. All right, so, sounds something that's real simple to do. What a reason it wasn't there till 2015, but we added it. Um, and then I always like to ask this question. Keep in mind our goal with bond packages is growth pays for growth. All right, um, and you saw the slide where it's currently uh, 15 cents of your property tax. We're gonna take that down to 14.75, uh, goes to service debt. So if growth pays for growth, what asked like to ask is who grew up in Fort Worth? Show of hands, we got Gary the cameraman, <laughs> pretty much, and, um, uh, and, and a room full of probably 30 people. And so at some point, bond dollars has paid for infrastructure for each of us to, whether it be a road, whether it be a library, whether it be a police station, whatever it may be, so always relevant there. So. All right, TPW is coming up next. I do apologize for my District 4 residents that arrived late due to traffic congestion. <laughs> I want to let you know that our TPW director also had to get, got here late because he got stuck in traffic. <laughs> but he does a pretty good job, and so we'll let them, uh, let them tackle the next topic. So, Oh, it's Lauren. Okay, all right. All right, well, good evening. I'm Lauren Preer. I'm the Assistant Director for Capital Delivery. So my group is primarily responsible for building your bond program projects. And I'll warn you, I am not coordinated enough to flip these slides and, and go through my presentation at the same time. So uh, bear with me, I am an engineer. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're gonna be talking about, uh, just kind of give you a brief program update on our arterials, our mobility projects, as well as our neighborhood streets projects, as well as touch on uh, some of our transportation management updates for this past fiscal year. So first off for arterials at Basswood and Kroger Drive, the construction of the widened crossing by UPR will take place simultaneously with our city's construction at this project. Furloughs and COVID have delayed the drafting of an agreement between the city and UP. And so the construction start is currently scheduled for next summer based on the 12 month lead time for the railroad to design and start construction after the signing of the agreement. Kroger Drive from Park Vista Circle to Ray White will be resurfaced and striped in addition to intersection and sidewalk improvements. So construction began this June and is anticipated to complete in March. North Riverside Drive. So construction of our first segment of North Riverside Drive from North Tarrant Parkway to Old Denton Road is substantially complete. The Summerfields Boulevard extension was added as a change order to this project. That's also wrapping up. So project funding for phase two of North Riverside Drive is from developer contributions and impact fees. Construction began this month with completion anticipated next fall. So segment three from Keller Hicks to Golden Triangle is completing utility relocations. Uh, the project will be a bid this September with construction scheduled to begin in about January. All right, mobility and intersections. So the North Beach Street and Basswood intersection improvement project includes a full signalization modification as well as dual left turn lanes. So this project is currently under construction and scheduled for completion this December. Ooh, got a little out of order. 
So the East 4th Street to 1st Street project will provide on-street bike lanes and sidewalks. The majority of funding on this project will come from federal grants, with construction anticipated to begin in November of 2023. So our next step is an advanced funding agreement with TxDOT scheduled for this fall. The off-street shared use path and sidewalk con connection project is actually a two-phase project. Uh, so phase one scope includes the installation of a 10-foot uh, wide shared use path in Gateway Park. Uh, so the construction of this phase has actually started this month and will complete in September of 2021. Phase two is also for a shared use path from Haltom Road to Lake Havasu Trail outside Gateway Park. Uh, so utilities are currently being cleared for this project and once complete, construction will then begin. So the city is pursuing, pursuing TxDOT Section 130 funds for this, really to leverage our bond railroad safety program funds. So our next step is to pursue an, or is to complete an advanced funding agreement with TxDOT, which is scheduled for this fall. So once this, a, what we call an AFA has been executed, we'll provide more scheduled details. So the plan scope of work for this project will include roadway widening, vertical profile changes, installations of medians, uh, signage, striping, and lighting work. So this project is also going to incorporate uh, TRE's upcoming double track construction across this intersection. So similar to our last slide, our next step in this project is to pursue the advanced funding agreement with TxDOT this fall. Uh, so the scope of work at Riverside and Beach includes the construction of new medians, sidewalks, uh, curbs, signing, striping at the crossing, plus an establishment of a quiet zone at this railroad. So in 2018, Safe Routes to School Part 1 project was advertised for construction this August 19th and will open bids in September. So the scope of work for this project includes the construction of new sidewalks, uh, curb ramps and driveways with an approximate quarter mile radius of Bonnie Bray Elementary and Council District 4. On this project, we also have W.J. Turner and Diamond Hill Elementary Schools in Council District 2. All right, so we have two neighborhood street projects in Council District 4, which include Kimbo Road, Altaview Street, uh, McComas Road, Creek Fall, and Mesa Verde Trail. These two projects have been completed under the 2018 bond. Contract 7 for Ellis Road, Kings Highway, Oakview Street, Seaman Street, Selma Street are under construction with a completion scheduled for May of 2022. And just a brief update on what our transportation management folks have been up to this year. Uh, so Vision Zero, Roger touched on this a little bit. Uh, Council adopted a resolution in November of 2019 that supports development of a Vision Zero strategy to eliminate traffic fatalities and severe injuries. So in support of this effort, the following schools have received updated signs, refreshed pavement markings, and preventative maintenance on flashing beacons. So the following sidewalks were repaired or installed in Council District 4 this year. The following streets have received new pavement markings in Council District 4 this year. And over 100 lights have been upgraded to LED in Council District 4 this year. Uh, nine knockdown poles have been, been reinstalled, three signals upgraded, and over 400 work orders closed. So that concludes all the details of my presentation. Um, like we said earlier, we have plenty of transportation and public work staff available uh, to talk about individual projects that we have currently ongoing or projects that you would like to see in the future. Uh, we've got our project map, map set up over here, so we'd love to talk to you afterwards. I see questions there, and I haven't seen the map, so I apologize. But uh, as we know, 170 is getting extended, fixed, updated. Something's going on with it. And I know they're going to close Alta Vista. 
and I don't see anything happening with the beach. Uh, do you have any any updates on what's going to happen? Like how we're going to get up to 170 from beach? We go all to this right. and now, but. You know, we can talk about this in more detail. There are some developer projects planned for Beach Street. Right now, we don't have anything on the 2022 bond, uh, but there are some segments that we can talk about. Wait, wait. There was one slide of feedback about the schools that was supposed to be finished May 22. And it started in April, but it's only 20% finished. And it's going to be finished by May. That's a big jump. That was it. So this safe routes to school? Don't go forward. That way, right, sir. Oh, yeah. So it's it's May of 2022. Yeah, that's next time. Right. And we, we began in April of 2021. And we have our neighborhood streets project manager here, I believe Jeff Perigo, um, but I believe these are accurate status updates. Okay. Thanks. 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 All right. You know, likely, likely what you're seeing here is, is over the summer we've made some gains, especially with the, the drier weather, um, more opportunities for work days. Um, so maybe this might be a month old in terms of status completion. Stay on them. Stay on them. And stay on me as well. And, and uh, we're doing better with getting things built quicker. We've staffs change how the re utility relocates. Um, need to get better some right away acquisition, but for the most part, they are deploying those dollars uh, faster than we have in the past. But we need to do it even even quicker. Um, and and keep in mind, you know, District Four. There's there's 34 neighborhoods just in District Four. Those 115,000 people. We've got uh, Garden of Eden here. You know, Trina. We've got White Lake Hills with with Charles and Lane. We've got Park Glen. We've got Heritage. Uh, we've got We've got uh, summer fields, you know, so we got to all raise our hand and know that there's a scoring system for, for all these things. And this is just one bucket of money. There's, there's other projects you see going on right now that are tied to the bond, which would be this library, the police station, Riverside. But there's other buckets of money as well as far as transportation impact fees, things of that nature that we can, we can deploy and, uh, and do that. So, yes, ma'am. Yes, speaking of summer fields, we've been waiting for a community center in that area. Yeah. We've been uh, coming across some teams to assign those rides. We've been talking about it for three years now. Yep. I think Fort Worth has now put it on their site that we do see suicide teams. Yep. And we, it takes 40 minutes for my 11 year olds to walk to the YMCA that's on Beach, North Beach, and they can't go across the highway to go to the other, which is Northwest. That was good. We need something. We need something there. And I spoke to Mr. Savala. He was so sweet and kind to me. But he said that maybe he could connect with the Parks and Recreation and get some staff people to get there at the schools, open them up after school or something. But we really need something for the young people. Um, I think I was promised something in 2023, but every year, one more. We lose one more. And it's not worth getting another library. We don't get a community center in that area. One more child lost is not right. Yeah, well done. We can pay for those types of things outside of bond funds as well. And so what I remind staff is our side of I-35, north of 820, we have a city the size of Waco. You know, the other side of I-35 is a city the size of Denton. And uh, there's a lot, of infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of demand up here, as well as the infield development. You see a lot of those bond dollars going back inside Fort Worth because we're trying to adjust where development occurs with that infrastructure. And so overall, um, you know, we've got a lot of opportunities to, uh, to deploy dollars, to uh, approve bond dollars and reinvest in, in infrastructure. So real quick, go ahead. I think I wanted to piggyback on what he said. I've been waiting 22 years for the rising in some of the people. Yeah. And I've worked with the volunteer homeowners associations and others in an effort to try to see it happen. 
And I know he tried to say, oh, the YMCA took the place of him. It didn't. <laughs> and now I'm a senior citizen. And I would love to see a senior citizen in our area center because the communities around us aren't as friendly as you think they are with somebody outside your area. Okay. And that's, that is true. So well said. Um, we are working on a variety of items. Um, one project you'll have you'll have in front of you here in a few months does include some senior programming into in, in addition to a lot of youth programming. But let's let's keep pushing because there's again there's other ways to do that than just a uh, just a bond election. Okay. So with that we're going to go to redistricting. And what I'll talk when I spoke earlier about the process of every four years there being election on bonds. What I want you to think through from a redistricting standpoint, and you see it going on once a, once a uh, decade um, with city council. Well, in 2016, we did a charter election, and we went to the public. Just as we'll go to the public and say, hey, do you want to do this bond or not? In 2016, we went to the public and said, do you want to add two more council districts? And it, it passed, 100 votes, but it passed. And so... District 4, as an example, at the time, um, we had eight council districts, was drawn to 101,000 people. Um, most districts were drawn to about an average of about 90,000. So given the 2020 census data, city of Fort Worth is 918,000 people. Again, that's probably 20,000 shy since 2021, but we gotta work on 2020 census data. So, and then based on that 2016 election, we're adding two council districts. So we go from eight council districts to 10. So again, that means each council district is gonna be about 91,000 people. You can vary that about 10% on each side. Um, but then 2016, we had the election. 2021, so you have a a member of mayors and council there. Then 2021, you have another set of members of mayor and council. And the goal with, with the prior councils is to take the decision of redistricting out of the hands of the people that are most likely to run for the 2023 election. Okay, that's what we've been trying to do. And so prior to the May 2021 election, there was a plan that was put forth that would remove council members for the most part from that and what I'll tell you is everyone here will have the chance to draw a map and to make recommendations in there. Um, I hope that we preserve some of the integrity of the existing districts. I hope that we focus on neighborhoods staying together, schools staying together, uh, don't gerrymander, uh, consider communities of interest um, and we can come up with a pretty good um, formula, pretty good, pretty good fair map for everybody. What I, what I will suggest, and you've heard me say this publicly, you know, first keep in mind, District 4, we're gonna lose 25,000 people, okay? So I know there's 3,000 people that didn't vote for me last time. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, so we wanna preserve the neighborhoods in that, but, but I'll lose about 25,000 people. District 7, which is closest to us, just across Golden Triangle, it's going to lose about 67,000 people. District 2, which is across 35, um, is going to lose 25,000 people. And so you can see, I mean, I hope I get to keep all of you, but I may not be able to. And so just know that there will be a, a, a process that you can be part of for that. And the, the city council will have the, will have the final vote on that. All right. So with that, we'll turn it over to Fernando let him talk through this. Thank you, Council Member. I think that was the best introduction I've ever received to a presentation about <laughs> redistricting. Uh, very well done. Uh, I'll try to cover any details that uh, Carrie didn't uh, uh, discuss. Redistricting in, uh, in, in basic uh, terms is the process by which the City Council will redraw its district boundaries so as to make each council district roughly the same size in population. Uh, and it's a process that they follow every 10 years after the decennial census. And just about three weeks ago, the U.S. Census Bureau released 
the results of the April 2020 census. It took a long time because it was delayed by COVID, but now we have the block level population data that we can use to redraw district boundaries. Our vendor, a company called ESRI, is now incorporating all the data into our redistricting software, and our staff, uh, by the middle of this month, in about two weeks, will be incorporating another layer of data about what's called uh, communities of interest. So by September 20th, any interested citizen will be able to start drawing maps to submit for consideration by the city council. Any interested citizen, you will have equal standing with city staff or with any organized group to be considered uh, by the city council. And the great equalizer is this redistricting software. Has anybody attended one of the training sessions for redistricting software? Yes, what'd you think about it? You were there, did you enjoy it? It made sense. Uh, it was, um, did, did you find it to be understandable? It didn't require a high level of mathematical or geographic skill. No. So almost any uh, well-informed uh, citizen can learn to use the redistricting software. And we will be having more sessions. We've had several already, but we'll have more. And if you're part of a group that would like to have a training session specifically for your group. If you have a, a large enough group, we will organize a session just for you. So uh, this is a real important part of the whole redistricting process. The city council will make the final decisions, but they will be guided by what the citizens recommend to them. So that's why we encourage citizens to participate. This is really democracy in its purest form, where citizens can uh, present recommendations that meet the adopted criteria for full consideration. So we would give you that encouragement. By the way, uh, the city is going through redistricting, but so is the county, so are the different school districts, and so is the state. The state legislature uh, will be having another special session specifically on redistricting later this year. And they will be getting into state legislative districts, both House and Senate, and they'll be getting into congressional districts. And I can tell you that's gonna be a, a dogfight. But uh, in Fort Worth, it's gonna be peaceful uh, and uh, harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right. So there you go. You can quote it. Uh, the city council wanted to be sure to get sound advice about what criteria and procedures they should follow. So just last year, uh, almost exactly a year ago, they created a redistricting task force comprised of, of citizens to give the council advice of, as to how the council should redraw the boundaries. And here's a list of the citizens who served on that task force. Craig Allen represented uh, District 4. Uh, the chair of the task force was Lorraine Miller, a very well-respected uh, uh, citizen who's held many important positions at the, at the national level in Washington. She was actually the uh, clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives. It's a big deal. So she knows all about redistricting, voting rights, and all of those issues. Uh, so she brought a lot of uh, knowledge to her uh, leadership of the task force. But a lot of good folks, you probably recognize some of the other names on that list, former council member Sal Espino, former council member Burt Williams, and, and, and others uh, are familiar names in Fort Worth. So they gave us wonderful advice, and they identified two major reasons for doing redistricting. One is to make sure that the districts are roughly equal in population. That's a big deal because in the last 10 years, District uh, 7 has exploded in population. The far north part of Fort Worth has grown very rapidly other parts have grown much more slowly. Every district has grown, but they've grown at very different rates. So the districts are now well out of balance. And, and, and Councilor Moon was just describing how lopsided some of the districts are today. So we need to rebalance those districts. And also, as Councilmember mentioned, we're adding two new districts. The voters of Fort Worth in 2016 passed charter amendments to, to make that uh, a, uh, a requirement uh, for redistricting. 
And so we just got the results of the 2020 census. Our official population count is 918,915. Councilmember Moon alluded to some more recent uh, estimates of population. Those are unofficial. We think that today, Fort Worth's population is probably in the ballpark of 940,000. But redistricting is based on the actual headcount on April 1st, 2020. So that's the figure we're using. That means about 115,000 population per district uh, is what we currently have. Now, when we redistrict, we're going to be using 918,000. Councilor Moon said we're going to have 10 single member districts. So each single member district, all you have to do is divide 918,000 by 10. That tells you about 91, 92,000 persons per new district. They're going to be smaller in size than the current districts. And so here you can see uh, the population of each of the ten single, eight single-member districts according uh, to the U.S. Census. Uh, and you can see uh, District 7, for example, grew by 76 percent. It now has a population of 157,000. That's almost the size of two council districts in one. Uh, so you can see the different growth rates. District 9, which is the, in the near south side of uh, Fort Worth, grew at the slowest rate, only uh, 4%. So you can see a lot of variation. Uh, here's a, a breakdown. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but if you're interested, we can, we can explore it further. This is the demographic composition of the city's population. And you can see that the uh, different uh, demographic segments grew at, at different rates. Uh, you can see, for example, that the, that the uh, black or African-American population grew by 29%. That exceeded any of our expectations. It's grown very rapidly. The Hispanic population grew by 27%. So, so the black population grew at a faster rate than the Hispanic population. Uh, that's uh, really uh, a change from the previous uh, decade. The Asian population grew even faster, over 70% growth. And, and now the Asian population is 5% of Fort Worth. 5% of Fort Worth is Asian. Uh, and uh, the other population grew at the even faster rate, even though that's a very small segment, over 100% growth, more than double uh, the population that considers itself other, multiracial, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, big changes in the city's population so that today uh, whites represent about 37% of the population. Hispanics about 35%, African American 19%, Asian 5, other 5, other 4%. So there is no one group that is dominant uh, in the demographics of Fort Worth. That's a, uh, the most diverse forest population has ever been. Uh, and it makes redistricting uh, even more uh, challenging. Now if we zoom in on, on Council District 4, uh, you can see how, how this particular district is doing, uh, and you can see the, the, the breakdown uh, of the population uh, for District 4. You can see that the, the white population of District 4 actually declined uh, in District 4. I expect a lot of that uh, is probably uh, Meadowbrook uh, and, and, and parts uh, of District 4 inside Loop 820, where we've seen a lot of uh, Hispanic families uh, replacing uh, white families. Uh, so that's why you see a, a, a decline. In, far, in, the, in, the, in the part of District 4 north of 820, I expect you will see an increase uh, in the white population. And, and we could break uh, this information down by smaller uh, geographic units. But you can see the black population grew uh, uh, by over, uh, uh, well, roughly 26 percent, Hispanic 27 percent, uh, Asian 39 percent, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, nevertheless, as you can see from the, uh, the pie chart, the overall District 4 has a 44% uh, uh, white population. Uh, now, three broad goals in redistricting to prevent gerrymandering. Councilor Moon alluded to it. Uh, gerrymandering is uh, drawing irregular lines to give preferential treatment to one interest group or another. That's something we want to avoid. Uh, we want to provide the best opportunities to elect council members who reflect our diverse population, and we want to promote education and public participation in the redistricting process. Uh, 
I won't need to go into detail here, but uh, suffice it to say that the redistricting task force last year did a lot of uh, research, engaged in a lot of discussion, conducted a lot of public meetings, heard from a lot of citizens uh, before making their recommendations. And uh, they held uh, uh, several public hearings. They delivered their final report to the city council in March, and the council in April adopted a, rec a, a resolution that established the criteria and procedures for redrawing council district boundaries. Uh, here's uh, uh, some data on the public participation. A lot of folks took part, a lot of speakers, and a lot of written statements. And the three main comments that they made uh, at the public hearings, one is that most of the citizens who spoke favored an independent redistricting commission. They emphasized the need for greater public participation and the need for greater transparency so that folks would know how the, the lines are being redrawn and could get uh, an explanation for any changes in council district boundaries. So uh, this is uh, the resolution that they adopted in April, accepting the final report of the task force and establishing the criteria and procedures. And here's a listing of the criteria. These are the five most important, the top priority criteria. Equal size, complying with all relevant laws, creating what are called minority opportunity districts, containing communities of interest within single council districts. So if, if you live in a neighborhood or in a cluster of neighborhoods that wants to stay together, maybe you have a school attendance zone that you want to make sure stays together in redistricting, isn't split, you need to register as a community of interest uh, with, uh, with Michelle Goot in our uh, communications and public engagement uh, department uh, by September 15th. Uh, and you can go online uh, to, it's a very simple process. We just need to know who you are and what your boundaries are. And then we'll be able to advise the city council that you want to be uh, respected as a community of interest and contained within a single council district, not split. Uh, we've got, for example, the Riverside Alliance, who is saying they don't want to be split. They want to be uh, contained in one council district instead of three. Uh, the East Side Alliance of, of, of Neighborhoods also wants to be contained within a single council. That's going to be very hard to do. In fact, you will find, if, if, if you started to play with the software, it is almost impossible to meet all the criteria simultaneously. You may be able to meet most of the criteria, but it's almost impossible to meet all of the criteria at the same time and satisfy everybody. It's just, it's just a, a, an impossibility uh, uh, mathematically. And finally, contiguous territory, you can't have different fragments uh, consisting, uh, uh, constituting a single council district. Then there are uh, five other criteria of, of lower priority uh, districts should be compact, and there, there's a math mathematical way. There are actually many different mathematical ways of measuring compactness, but there's a particular formula that the council has adopted. Identifiable geographic boundaries containing whole voting precincts as well as whole census block groups, blocks or block groups. And finally, not considering the place of residency of incumbents or potential candidates when redrawing those boundaries. Uh, and then they established some uh, redistricting procedures, registering communities of interest, encouraging residents to produce their own maps, selecting an initial map as a starting point, explaining the rationale for any changes to the map, uh, making sure that redistricting is a single agenda item when the city council wants to consider it. So they have to have a special meeting just on redistricting. It can't be just a, one of many agenda items. And then a variety of public hearings uh, before and after they propose, prepare a proposed map. And finally, transparency, any communication must occur in official meetings. There won't be any backroom deals. Uh, if uh, Councilor Moon wants to discuss a trade with uh, Council Member uh, Firestone, they need to do it in a public meeting and then explain why they made the changes that, that they made. Uh, so this is the, the process we've been following uh, we've had the software training, continue to have it. We have registration for communities of interest ongoing. We just got on August 12th the release of the uh, census data. On October uh, 5, we're going to have a joint work session of the redistricting task force and the city council. And that leads us to the actual redistricting process. 
October and November are going to be dedicated to citizens redrawing their own uh, district maps. By December, we'll brief the council on what the citizens have submitted. We'll also present a staff recommended map. The council can uh, select an initial map. They'll have a hearing before and a hearing after they select that map. Then the council will spend February and March drawing maps. By April, we'd like for them to adopt uh, a map following a series of public hearings, at least four in paired council districts. Uh, that's important because we have until uh, July to have these maps uh, adopt, the, the, the final map adopted. That's because there's a 180-day a day period before uh, filing for uh, the next election by which any uh, candidate must establish residency in the district they want to represent. Uh, so uh, if, for example, we draw uh, the, the lines in such a way that uh, Councilmember Moon is no longer living in his district, he has to decide whether to move uh, to the district he wants to represent or to represent another district. Uh, so uh, we want to give uh, potential candidates some time uh, to make that decision. So that's why it's important to, to get it adopted as early as possible, April or May, June at the latest, uh, so that uh, folks can uh, establish residency by July. And all of this is leading to the, the next council election in May of 2023. And so uh, that's a, a, a full rundown on the redistricting process, and uh, we'd be happy to entertain any, any questions you might have. Yes, sir, please. And then the lady behind you. I have two slides. Yes, sir. In the process, maybe back one more. One sorry. more? Yes, sir. This one? Yeah. Okay, in January 2022, it says initial map, the city yes. council select. That sounds like after all the input, there's an initial map. After, after, yes, yes, sir, exactly right. After all the citizens have submitted their maps, there will be a public hearing, and then the council will say, I, I want to uh, select the map uh, produced by the, the Summerfields Neighborhood Association, uh, or I want to select the map produced by city staff, or whatever map they think is the best starting point, and then they'll be able to adjust the boundaries based on that starting point. Okay, but there's no initial map before that, it's been recognized. No, sir. No, no, no. So it's just a clean slate? It's a clean slate. Your, I thought I saw one of your slides that says there's a map that's being put out there right now for people to consider. No, no, no. No, no, there is no such map. There are rumors of such a map, but there is no such map. <laughs> okay, let's eliminate that right now. <laughs> there is no map. We're starting from a clean slate. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Create these maps. Yes, Where and how is that being communicated out to the communities? Because that has been sorely lacking with the city, making sure that they're touching. Yes, ma'am. Michelle, do you want to you want to answer? Uh, we have a website um, that has a lot of the redistricting information on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's uh, fortworthtexas.gov and then backslash redistricting. We also have, um, if you receive our city news, you get that through, um, it's a service called Gov Delivery, and we're able to put different topics on there. We actually have a redistricting topic that people have subscribed to where we've been sending out the information. We also put it in city news. We put it out on social media, next door, and it's also sent out through the community engagement bulletin to all of our registered neighborhoods and community organizations. But I'd say if you really want to know about next steps, I would recommend subscribing to that redistricting topic because that's definitely going to have all of the information sent to that group in addition to all the other city channels. I have three handouts over here that I encourage everybody to pick up. Um, the first one, it's about the communities of interest and how you can register. Um, we have a link on the web page. It's a very simple form, but this gives you all of the information on that. We also have the cheat sheet for the redistricting software that um, we have the handout, and then a listing of all the criteria that Fernando went over. It's in a handout, and it also has the website. So th that's how we've been sharing the information for the training. We did the first session of training. 
Um, we had about 50 people total that came out to the training sessions that we had. We, um, this was all practice because we didn't have the census data for 2020. Now that we have the census data that's being updated, we're gonna be entering the communities of interest as they register. And we'll have, um, on September 20th, the software will be ready for people to start drawing actual maps. So our next round of trainings will start the last week of September. And we're gonna have a combination of training or uh, meetings that people can come to. We'll have training sessions for people who want to learn how to use the software. And we're also going to have sessions, which we're calling collaboration sessions, where people who are interested can come and work with other residents and staff using the technology to create maps. And that's going to be for um, you know people who maybe who aren't comfortable with using the software on their own or just want to be part of a larger group discussion. We also have a link on our webpage where we will come out and talk to different groups and provide training to your organization. I just got word today that two neighborhood associations will be going out to their meetings and providing training to them. So there's a link for that also on the, on the webpage. Given that you're still in the middle of uh, increased COVID issues, is there any possible online training opportunity so you, you can actually go ahead we actually taped our first training session and that video is available on the web page we also have the links to five different videos that are provided by the uh, company esri which provide information and we have a copy we have a copy that you can download the powerpoint of the training manual that was used in the training session so we have the video plus the manual available on the website would this powerpoint be available as well yes if you be sure you leave your email on the sign in sheet and i will send copies of all of the powerpoint presentations to you that were covered in today's meeting. Good. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Uh, by the way, we, we couldn't be doing this process without Michelle's leadership. She's, she's uh, been magnificent uh, in, uh, in getting citizens uh, involved. And, and the turnout has, has really exceeded our expectations. There's a lot of interest in, in redistricting. Uh, and I, I should have mentioned, you don't need to use a public computer to, to run the software, you can, we, we can give you a license to, to, to run the software at home. We'll give you an account uh, for, from Esri. Uh, and so, say that again? Spell it, Esri. Oh, Esri, E-S-R-I. It, it originally stood uh, for Environmental Systems Research Institute, but now they just go by Esri. Uh, and you, you can look them up, they, they are, they are the uh, gold standard of geographic information systems. And have we made sure that we have this as a multilingual opportunity? Yes. Yes, and we actually, the, Go ahead, we, we have to use the mic because we're, we're recording this so that we could post it online for people who didn't want to, uh, to come out today. So um, we have the material um, in Spanish translated and um, I will have to check, but I am pretty sure. I know that that it's available in multiple languages. I'm not sure how many, but if you use the, the software. And it's cloud-based, so you can use it from any computer. And if you get the cheat sheet over here, it gives you the address where you can go on and set up an account. And we also have a hotline. So if you're using the software and you're having a problem, we have an email that goes to our staff who's working on this project, and they will reach out to you and help you answer questions or get past whatever obstacle you're having with the software. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our fourth finest. Um, appreciate uh, all y'all's regular engagement and uh, appreciate your voting in July of 2020 to fund our police, 65%, uh, 35% to fund our school resource officers and uh, neighborhood patrol officers and programs that we've done. I'm proud of our record in Fort Worth uh, from a community policing standpoint. Um, we uh, you know, have, have added crisis intervention teams. We've asked, added de-escalation training. We've obviously chokeholds have been banned, um, but we've been responsive to uh, 
to both community policing measures and proactive policing measures as we work to address uh, the challenges that we're facing as a city on, uh, on violent crimes. And so with that, I want to introduce uh, Commander Mahaffey. Where do you go? There he is. Right there, and I'll let you introduce your team. <laughs> and we're not Dallas. That's right. No, we're not. Uh, I don't have a presentation. I'm going to somewhat basically just tell you from the heart about North Division. We've North Division is defined as anything north of Loop 820, basically to the city limits line, boundaried by Keller, and then we wrap around Haslett over to the west. Uh, just this year, North Division has grown almost 5%, and that's year to date, the first six months. So if you look at that in terms of other areas of the city, uh, our other patrol divisions, North has grown at a faster rate and more than any other division. We're sitting right now at about 236,000 residents within the North Patrol Division that our facility off North Riverside services. Uh, overall, I can say the crime rate, of course you talk crime rate, you're talking numbers, numbers and statistics, we know how it usually goes. But overall, we have an extremely low rate of violent personal crime per capita in North Division. We're very blessed in that regard. And I think that has a lot to do with our partnerships, a lot to do with the fact that suspicious activity gets called in quickly, and also the economic growth in North probably exceeds any other division, including the far west developments. Uh, year to date, so far this year, our property crime, hard number under hard numbers, running a little less than a 4% decrease. So what you're seeing is kind of a bifurcation. You're seeing our population going up while our rate of property crime going down. And I challenge you in any other major city to find that right now. And that is happening just in North Division specifically is what I'm speaking to. And if you factor in our population increase, then our property crime is almost about 10% down per capita. But hard numbers were about 5% down. Uh, the most prevalent offense that we see up here is car crime as far as property goes. And I mean all car crime from the teenagers walking, checking door handles, going fishing in the vehicles for whatever's in there, all the way to people that are actually going to break your glass. Um, and then now we're finding the most irritating thing is the catalytic converter thefts where you come out and start your car and it sounds like a 1962 John Deere because there's no catalytic converter anymore. Uh, we do actively work those cases. Those are very important cases. But car crime in general is it. But even then, factoring in car crime, we still have a very low occurrence. Uh, again, as compared to other areas of the city and as compared to some of our historical data. Uh, we have great partnerships in North. Uh, our city leaders have been blessed to give us a great facility over in the 8,000 block of North Riverside Drive. Uh, anybody that wants to see it, please stop by. Uh, it is basically the cookie cutter that they're using for a lot of the other facilities that are being built uh, are going to be inspired by the facility there. Uh, but other than that, that's my introduction. Uh, does anybody have, I guess, any specific questions about your neighborhood or crime in general or the police department in general? Yes, sir. I got a question for you. I was at the pop-up maybe two weeks ago. Oh, thank you. And the question came up about, I guess, the 911 staffing. Yes. And what was being done. And just you give us an update. And the reason I'm asking this is because I firsthand experienced this probably like Monday or Tuesday, where literally three of us were calling 911 and we could not get through. And we were trying to help somebody else. So I didn't understand. I mean, I read about it. I heard it. But after seeing it, it was like, okay, this has got to change. So can you just kind of give us an update? Okay. It feels different when you experience it. Now, did, let me ask you a question. Did, did this happen after the pop-up? Yes. It did happen. Okay. I can tell you that we're actively recruiting and we are actively processing applications. We've increased the number of background investigators that are processing those applications because even though it's a civilian assignment, there are still police or public safety specific um, hiring practices that we have to follow. Uh, including the background, polygraph, and things of that nature. But if anybody has anybody in your family that is looking for a dispatcher, call taker type job, we are hiring. 
Uh, but actually, we've taken a few different approaches. First of all, we've taken some of our light duty officers and placed in our communications center to answer the non-emergency calls. So we free up our experienced dispatchers to answer the 911 calls. Uh, we're also, uh, last I checked, working with a third party to possibly bring in other state certified dispatchers on a right now basis so we can put them immediately to work to fill that gap. And essentially we've tried and have implemented a variety of shift variants from eight hours to 10 hours to 12 hour shifts, uh, including overtime, while trying to balance the wellness of our employees at the same time. And sometimes that's kind of a tricky balance, you know. In that regard, yeah. it's just like the nurses who are on the front lines, exactly. they want to burn these people out because right. they're very critical. The yeah, follow up question to that was in my experience, I dialed 911, then I got, finally got transferred to the Fort Worth line, which I thought was very interesting because I live in Fort Worth, they got 817 number, but it's like, what's you, his link? You didn't land on the Fort Worth 911 center? No. <laughs> so that was the frustrating part. It so happened, yeah, happened to me three times. And then while I was waiting, I got some message, well, if you need fire or ambulance, dial these two numbers. I don't know if it was one number or two numbers, but blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I don't know what you said, and I'm sitting here trying to help somebody. I don't have time to think about what numbers. I just need to get to a 911 operator. So I heard there were some suggestions about hitting a number to get to whatever that was. I don't right. know. Yeah, we call that just a push through. And I'm not a complete expert in the 911 system, however, uh, absorbing what I've heard from meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, they are looking at the push through system to where you press a button and you immediately are pushed through to the next um, appropriate shop. But they were using the uh, particular call uh, recordings for if you need EMS and it's a non-emergency, if you need FD and it's a non-emergency, to try those other numbers in order to free up our public safety communicators to answer the real emergencies. Uh, essentially, we're trying every option right now uh, while hiring, while processing, while doing backgrounds, while pulling in light duty officers, while adjusting the shifts, while keeping the wellness of our employees intact, while pulling in vendors that are, can provide us right now um, service providers, dispatchers, but n none of that changes the way you feel whenever you call 911 and that happens. I, got one, I was trying to help somebody, yeah. but I was flipping on the other side. If I was the person in need, and my loved ones were trying to get somebody to help me, I'm like, man, that was a bad situation, totally. I can tell you that uh, it's a very important issue. We take it very seriously, and we are working the problem from every angle. We have made some good strides, though, but still we are experiencing some congested times. Uh, some of those times are predictable. Some of those times are not. So, But I definitely understand what you're saying. Thanks. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, I'm on the uh, south end of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here just kind of get some up. Could you have your best, just a guess, and I don't want you to if you can. You know what would be the average wait time when a person calls for an officer on the north end? How long would it take them to arrive? If you pop the top of your head, do you have any? No, our, our average response times is going to vary depending on so many factors, but I'll break it down to you and give you as precise an answer as I can. When our calls come into the 911 system, they're triaged as a priority one call, meaning basically life safety. A priority two call, which is, it's important, but it's not immediate life safety. And a priority three call, which basically is almost administrative, we need to come take a report about something that's happening. What would be your time? How long would be you on that kind of call? On the priority three call, I really don't know off the top of my head, but what I can find out is if I get your name and information, I can get that info and get it back to you, but I really, I don't know. I was in an uh, uh, internet talk radio show here in the city. This oh. information I want to share out. So yeah, I'll give you a card. Okay. And, and I've got a card on number two, so if you have any problems, I'll give you any help with talking. I like it. My cell phone's always on. Always. Trust me. The, uh, yes, sir. I just wonder what you think might be uh, the cause of the decrease in crime. Do you have an opinion about that? And also, uh, kind of the hot topic for the last, I don't know, little while has been street racing. And I wonder if you could update oh, yeah. any of that for us. Oh, goodness. We're on tape, too, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, the first thing you asked was a two-part question. One was, uh, why is crime going down in North? 
and specifically uh, talk about the street racers. So the crime going down in North, I think a lot of that is attributable to y'all, the partnership that we have with our community. We have a very active Citizens on Patrol program. We have a very active crime prevention specialist. Say hi, Rosalinda. And she does all of our uh, neighborhood crime watch. In fact, we just had a meeting in a driveway last night uh, with a new group forming over in Sendera Ranch. It's the partnerships we have and the fact that any abnormal activity in the neighborhood gets immediately reported and then we promptly get on it. What we also do is once you join Citizens on Patrol, that was a blatant recruiting effort, uh, we actually conduct public-private partnership enforcement efforts where we will actively go patrolling with our citizen patrollers in an area that is basically kind of become hot that week. Uh, we, the Lieutenant Myers is in the back, raise your hand, and then I've got Lieutenant Stewart right there. Those are your two district lieutenants. Each have half of the city north of Loop 820. And they each get three reports a week, a Monday report, a Wednesday report, and a Friday report. So anytime there's a flare up, we know about it immediately and we can respond with our neighborhood officers, with our public-private partnerships, and we actually get out there and get sweaty and try to stop it. Uh, I think it's our partnerships, honestly, that has have helped drive that crime rate down while the population is going up. And street racers, uh, street racers. I can tell you that we had a very successful operation within the last few weeks. Uh, it is a very important issue, and uh, your council member has absolutely helped lead that charge and had helped draft the city ordinance that gives us the authority and the tools that we need in order to get the job done, which is get out there and do enforcement as they're gathering for the spectators who were out there. Because oftentimes you've got a big, huge group of spectators and only one or two active people out there driving like a fool and doing exhibition of acceleration and things of that nature. This way we have a tool. We just did an operation where we arrested, arrested 67 people and towed 29 vehicles to the auto pound in one operation. Yeah, it was fantastic. Not one pursuit, not one use of force, and not one wrecked city vehicle. I mean, those are some very fantastic results. Uh, and as a result of that, our gatherings in the city of some of our outlaw racing groups uh, have diminished. Uh, they're still going to pop up. We're still going to have to use the tool. We're still going to have to go out there and do enforcement. Uh, but it, it is a very important topic. Now, sometimes people confuse the actual racers with our people just driving with loud pipes at night and your house happens to back up. Uh, that's really not what the ordinance is for, but uh, Councilmember Moon has done a fantastic job pushing this ordinance forward and giving us the tools we need, and we have used it appropriately so far, and it's, it's worked. Yes, sir. Okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Question about, uh, just curious about the homeless community, and Councilman may can share that too about it. In our district, you know, it's quite a you know, large population of the homeless, and then there was repetitive that, you know, crimes that they do. Catalytic, I think that's the first. Yeah. That and just repetitive thefts, and if your stuff is not locked down, they just they have these little uh, little carts that they have on the bikes. And <laughs> it's it's an adventure. I mean, it's it's tough, but you know you just try to interact with them, speak with them, or whatever. But sometimes they get pretty. Good. Right. It is. Homelessness is a problem, and it is a very important issue. Uh, and it's not an issue that affects just the center core of the city. It also affects areas outside of the loop, such as ours. We have many approaches, one of which is our HOPE unit, which is our Homeless Outreach, Prevention, and Enforcement. And if you think about that acronym, outreach, prevention, and then finally, enforcement. So what we do is partner with a lot of groups in our homeless corridor, if you will, which is just southeast of downtown. And using those public-private partnerships again, uh, our specially trained officers will come out with those service providers 
and try to, if not solve homelessness at large, solve, hom solve homelessness for that one person. See if they're having mental health issues. Are they taking their medication, if so, prescribed? And of course, that's our partners, not us. And also, can we get them housing? Do they qualify? Can we move them from under the bridge or down by the river and get them in an appropriate housing situation? And again, we have a camping ordinance that has been recently passed as well. Um, also, Councilman Moon was a great supporter of that. So we do have the tools. Uh, we do have specially trained officers, but also our 911 radio cars, if you will, uh, have also been trained up to a degree so they know who to contact whenever we encounter that. But it, it does happen outside the center core of the city, you're right. You're welcome. Yes, sir. I understand there's a program with the county jail to have a diversion program on some, I guess it's called frequent flyer, where they have the mental health, don't have to go to the jail. Are you using that very much, or can you explain what that is better than I did? I cannot speak to that in depth, because the county jail and the district attorney's office, obviously, uh, in partnership when a case is filed, do have a variety of diversion programs. I can't necessarily speak to their behalf. But what I can say is that, again, the HOPE unit, who does a lot of our frontline interaction, our longer-term problem-solving, uh, they do have a variety of diversion-type programs. Uh, however, when a crime is still committed, we still take that seriously and still hold them accountable. But further down the line of the criminal justice system, if a diversion is appropriate, there are different moments for that if needed. So, okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. I don't know if this is the right place to do this, but you got on a uniform and it's <laughs> I'm here. That's, that's good. So, in our neighborhood, which is Woodhaven, um, we are concerned uh, the apartment complex went under new management, and so they instituted some policies that now have a line of 15 to 20 cars that park on the west side, east side of uh, our street. And we want to know, and I'm reading because I was given my script. That's okay. <laughs> um, what we need to do to get a no parking sign on the east side of the street to match the one that's on the west side of the street. Right. It's a fantastic question. Oh, go ahead. So you want no parking on the other side of the street to match what's on this side of the street. Okay. I can tell you that Woodhaven is actually not my area of responsibility. However, that's not passing the buck either. I will put you in contact with the East Division commander, but to answer your question as if it were in my area, what I would do and have done as recently as last week is I would reach out to TPNW, who handles the no parking signage and zone classification for what is no parking. The police do the enforcement. TPNW makes the determination on what is or isn't no parking. But TPW has been a fantastic partner with us in listening to the police voice on what we think should be no parking. As an example, over here in the shopping center, just west of the freeway and south of uh, North Tarrant Parkway, we're having a whole street designated no parking because it's becoming a safety issue. So, right. Yeah, T TPNW will make that classification and do that review and study uh, with police input as well. And again, get with me after and I'll give you Commander Elgin's contact information. Well, and I didn't introduce a local celebrity here, but we do have our city traffic engineer, Mr. Raj Gupta here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if you, uh, if you have issues with the party, you can reach out to us and we will look into that and see. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Commander. Oh, thank you. So real quick, uh, we got about five minutes here. Just We'll kind of open the floor up for additional questions. Just uh, in general, I will say on the parking, uh, parking uh, concerns, I um, feel like we've we actually had concerns. We're, we're dealing with this, how I say it, in several spots. We're dealing with Oakland Hills, off of Waller Street, south of 30, and then along 820, um, the access road, uh, just north of the Albertsons. And so Alicia Ortiz, our wonderful district director, is back there. 
we actually had someone contact us in Woodhaven about the parking before, before Clarita Porter contacted us. So that was good. And uh, what we found out is, is the apartment complexes are now charging, you get one parking spot free, and then you pay for a second one. And so we are going back to first review what's our short-term and long-term options. Um, long-term is, is no parking, but when you do that, that's no parking for residents as well. And Hightower is one of the streets we're struggling where Hightower intersects Boca Raton. And, uh, and so we don't know necessarily that the residents of Woodhaven want that. And so we were going after the policy through legal to say, how do we make sure that when, we, when you build something, we make sure you got enough parking on your site. And so we got to make sure after you built something that you maintain enough parking on your site and don't restrict parking on your site at a fee. And so we are reviewing that. It is a challenge. Uh, it is something we need to address. It is a big safety issue um, and then it's also gonna be an enforcement issue because there's places off Oakland Hills where we have the no parking signs and right in front of the no parking sign is a parked car <laughs> and so I tell these guys all the time write tickets you know that's the best way to to enforce that um, so that's where we are I'm, I'm pretty proud of how our office works Alicia Ortiz is a big part of that but be the camping ordinance the homeless um, you know we, we run a very responsive responsive office so with that any couple minutes any questions yes sir I'm, I'm kind of in all these meetings doing kind of a survey. And I'd like to know how many here voted on the proposition two of adding two more council members, the 2016 charter vote. Has anybody here voted on that? Did you vote for that? Okay. Okay. Secondly, yes. Bob, let's leave the floor, but let's be considered the town hall here. Appreciate you coming out. So it was a 2016 election. It's a public process. We allowed them to vote. Uh, we put that in front of the you know, it's, my job's easy. My job's easy. Put it out there in front of the voters and let them decide what they want to do, and then follow the process there that was set forth by that by that uh, public vote. Um, with that, any other legitimate questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming out, and I'll be here a while if you want to talk some questions. Ask some questions. Thank you.